Well, guys, we are in a series um, that we call Joy to the World? <laughs> We're looking in this Advent season um, at why we as Christians have every reason to be joyful despite of all the things that are happening around us. We have every reason to be joyful this Christmas because of what Jesus has done for us. And in order for us to grasp this better, in order for us to kind of ha have some joy sparked in our hearts, <laughs> we're looking at Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, about Jesus, about what he would come to do. Uh, and there are, I don't know if you know this, there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus actually fulfilled in the New Testament. And so if we want to understand him better, we need to know about these prophecies. I, I don't, I, obviously, we don't have time to look at all 300, you know, but there's, there's so many things that were actually foretold about Jesus. The place of his birth, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would be a descendant of David, that he would go about and heal the sick, that he would uh, teach good news, that he would uh, teach in parables, that he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, that he would be betrayed by one of his friends for 30 pieces of silver. All of that's prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. Jesus, that he would be beaten, that he would be mocked, that he would be uh, laughed at, that he would be killed, that they would cast dice for his garments when they would kill him. All of that is prophesied. It's prophesied that he would atone for our sins, it, that he would uh, be raised from the dead, and that he would ascend into heaven. All of that is there in the Old Testament already. And, and we need to understand this. We need to look at the promises because they really help us grasp the, the richness and, and the meaning of Christmas. And today we are looking at one of those uh, prophecies, one of those promises in, in the book of Isaiah in chapter 35. Um, and this text is a real, a real Advent text. What is Advent actually? Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus. I know, right? Latin. <laughs> Adventus. <laughs> I know nothing about Latin, but I know this. Adventus means arrival, okay? And so Advent means we prepare to celebrate the arrival of Jesus, his first coming. That's Christmas. That's his first coming. But Advent also has a second meaning that we as Christians also have an expectation that Jesus will come a second time, that he will come back actually. And so it is preparation for celebrating his birth at Christmas, but it's also anticipation of him coming back again, of his second coming, that which is still to come, when he will actually come back to complete everything that he started to do at Christmas. And Advent, here's what's so helpful about Advent. Advent helps us to understand where we today sit in the story of God. And you need to know this. A lot of Christians don't know this we, because it's hard to understand. But I want to encourage you, take the time, take the, the weeks, the years to study this and to, to, get, to get your head around this and to try to understand this. So just very briefly, Jesus has come the first time. He has already come on Christmas. And just his very arrival, his very birth, split history into AD and BC, before Christ and after Christ. And that is actually appropriate because the birth of Jesus marks the beginning of a new era. Something that Jesus had launched, the, the kingdom of God has begun. But also the kingdom of God is not yet fully complete. It will be completed when he comes back a second time, uh, when, when, it's, it's, when, when he comes back to complete it. And so we're right now in between the first coming and the second. You need to know that we're, we're in this time where something has already begun, but it's not fully there yet. It hasn't fully been completed yet. There's still more to come. Jesus would constantly say, but wait, there's more. There's more. He still wants to do some more. We live in the in-between, which is also a bit of a frustrating thing because on the one hand, we know that we are safe from our sin, on the other hand, we still struggle with sin. On the one hand, we know we can pray for healing. On the other hand, people still get sick. On the one hand, we know that we are reconciled. On the other hand, marriages still fall apart. On, on the one hand, we know that we are made new. On the other hand, we're still getting old, <laughs> right? We live in this frustrating in-between. But one day, Jesus will return and he will complete what he started to do on Christmas. And you need to know about this. And maybe you're asking, well, well, what is it that he's going to do? What is it that he's going to complete then? 
And uh, I'm glad you're asking this question because Isaiah tells us. Let's look now at Isaiah chapter 35 at what Jesus will do when he comes back. I'm reading now from Isaiah chapter 35 verse 1 to 10. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beasts. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Wow, guys, there is a lot in here in this text. There's so much in here. This, this text is full of hope. This text is full of promises about uh, what Jesus would come to do, what he would start at Christmas and one day would complete. Uh, I find in this text, I find at least eight promises in here, eight prophecies about, about the Messiah, about what he would do. And um, I guess with eight promises, we could, we could do an eight-week series on this, guys. We could spend two months just on this chapter. And so we don't, today we don't have time to dig that deep into the text. But uh, we're going to just focus on one of those uh, promises today. Um, but since you asked, <laughs> I'm just going to mention really quick, I'm just going to mention all of these eight promises so at least you are aware of them. Because you need to know about this stuff. We need to know about the promises in the Old Testament, what God said he would do. And so I'll just mention all those eight and maybe if you want to write things down you need to really write quickly uh, because I'll just mention them and then we're going to spend time just on one of those uh, promises okay so the first thing that that is promised here is that God will replace barrenness with abundance he will replace barrenness with abundance it says here it talks about wilderness and deserts who will blossom again it talks about fertile fields and uh, green mountains and all of that in other words creation will be renewed God will make all things new. That's what this says. The second thing is, write this down, God will display his glory. God will display his glory, which means people will see God for who he really is. No more uh, funky ideas about uh, who God might be or any misconceptions about God. It will be the real thing, who God really is. And that's why Jesus came. Guys, this is what, one of the reasons why he came, because he wanted to show us what the Father is really like. The third thing is God will come to save God will come to save. Now, this is so important. Let me read these verses again. Verse 3 and 4. It says, Strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. I don't know if you feel tired these days or if you feel weak these days. This is a promise for you. Say to those with fearful hearts. I don't know if you're fearful these days. That's a promise for you. It says, Be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. God will come to earth. To save us and that's obviously that's what we celebrate at Christmas that he came to save us and he came to destroy our enemies all the evil all of the destruction all of the sin he came to put an end to it to put it down he'll come to save number four God will heal our brokenness 
God will heal our brokenness. It talks here about healing, uh, about restoration, no more blindness, no more deafness, no more lameness, no more disease, no more pandemics, no more aging, no more death. It reminds me of the last book of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, where it says there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more death. All of that will come to pass. And even in the life of Jesus, there's a, there's a verse in Matthew chapter 15, where it says that there were large crowds who came to Jesus and they brought to him all of those who were crippled, all of those who were mute, all of those who were blind. And it says, and he healed them all. He healed them all. When God shows up, there's healing. Our brokenness, our, our, our illnesses, our, 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 our fragileness is being healed. Number five, God will pour out his spirit. God will pour out his spirit. Now, Jesus has already done that, but there will be more to come. It talks here, there's an image here, actually, all over the Bible, when the, when the Bible talks about streams and, 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 and streams of water. It's, it's an image for the Holy Spirit. It talks here about streams that water the deserts and satisfy the thirsty lands. And wherever that river goes, things come to life. So God will pour out his spirit. Then number six, God will set our path on holiness. God will set our path on holiness. It's a phrase here called the highway of holiness. The highway of holiness, that's a road that leads through once deserted lands. And, and it's, it, 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 leads, it leads to life. It, it leads home. It, it leads to, it's kind of actually what this is, guys. It's, it's another exodus. Remember the first exodus when the people of Israel went through the desert to get to the promised land? This highway of holiness is another exodus, a way for us to get through the desert to the promised land. And it says here, it's a way that leads to the new Jerusalem, to heaven. It's a path of righteousness. And it only also says only the redeemed will walk on it. Only those who are made right with God will walk on this path this exodus path <laughs> uh, to the new Jerusalem. I know there's so much in there that may be so confusing already. It's like, it's really, we need to go back to this at some point and study this a whole lot deeper. Number seven, and this will be the one we're going to focus on today, is God will lead us home. God will lead us home. Write this down. In verse 10, it says, those who have been ransomed by the Lord, they will what? They will return. They will return. There's a homecoming party. Uh, we will return home because Jesus has come to save us. It is now possible for us to return home. That's what we're going to look at today. And lastly, there's an eighth one. God will fill us with joy. God will fill us with joy. It talks about us being crowned with joy. It talks about gladness and singing. We will be filled with joy. Now, those are the eight promises that are in here. Before we look now at the one about God leading us home, that we can return home. That's the one I want to focus on today. Let's now sing together and then we're going to look at this topic. In the Bible, there are different themes, different threads that are repeated again and again and again. They're kind of common Bible themes. For example, one of the themes is covenant. Again and again, we find the theme of covenants or, uh, or kingdom is, is a theme. God's presence is a theme. Worship bring in an offering. Those are themes that again and again the Bible talks about. It picks it up again, talks about it again. Uh, another one of those common threads in the Bible, one of the common themes in the Bible, is the theme of coming home. Or actually the theme of being in exile and then coming home. Being exiled and then a homecoming. We, we see this theme all over the Bible actually. It starts right in the beginning when you think about it that Adam and Eve, they lived in the perfect home and then they decided to turn from God and they lost at home and they were exiled, okay? They had the perfect place to flourish, but they lost their home. Jacob, he cheated his, his father and his brother and he spent years in exile. The Israelites in, in Egypt, <laughs> they were enslaved there. They were exiled there until Moses led them into the promised land. Uh, David, he was, hunt he was a hunted fugitive before he became a king. He was exiled. Uh, Israel was exiled again in Babylon. And then even at the time of Jesus, we know, well, they were in their homeland, but they were under Roman oppression. They were, they were it felt like exile. They, they were enslaved in their in their homeland, in their own land. And story after story uh, contains this pattern of 
exile and homecoming, being far away from home and then returning to where you belong. I think the message, one of the messages of the Bible is that everyone, every one of us, spiritually speaking, actually lives in exile. We, we live in exile. Spiritually speaking, we are homeless. We don't have a home. Now, what does this mean? What do I mean by that when I say we are spiritually homeless? We are spiritually in, in exile. And I think in order to understand exile, we first must understand what is actually a home. What is home? You know, one of the reasons why I think why we love Christmas so much is because it connects us uh, in our hearts. It connects us maybe quite nostalgically with home, with this idea of home. You know, there's certain foods that we eat, certain songs that we sing, certain smells even, certain all the lights, all the decorations, you know. It, it, it reminds us of home. We have all these sweet and fond memories that we try to connect with or something that we try to recreate even. That's also the reason why many people, especially at Christmas, feel incredibly homesick if they aren't wherever they think home is. They feel homesick. Home is where you feel warm, where you feel uh, relaxed, where you feel at ease, where you feel comfortable. Maybe you have moved house in your life before. Maybe at some point you moved to Berlin and you know that even though you had a roof on top of your head and you have your bed and you have your kitchen, it takes a while for a house to become a home because you're still, you're still trying to sort things out. And where am I going to put this? And, and where does this belong? And maybe this picture should be on this wall. And you're, you're still trying to sort it out. But once, once you feel like everything has found its place, everything fits you, <laughs> then it's become a home. Then it's like, ah, this is how I want it. Now it is a home. Uh, home is where everything has found its place. And that's why some of you may be traveling for work a, a lot, no, maybe not right now, but generally speaking. And so when you travel for work, you never feel at home, even though you have a bed maybe where you can stay in a hotel or something, or you have some, something to eat, you have a roof on top of your head, but you still, you don't feel like you're in, at home because nothing really fits. I mean, I find this every time I'm staying somewhere else because the bed is too short for me, okay? And I'm like, this is not my bed, definitely not. I don't fit in here. It doesn't suit me. This isn't home. It's it's just, I'm, I'm somewhere else. It is not home. What about the homeland even? The ho your homeland is where you understand the culture, the customs, the people, the language. It just, it just clicks with you. You understand it. You're, you're accustomed to it. You know, and that's why other cultures, it's interesting to study other cultures. I, I love traveling. I love exploring new cultures and learning about all these other places. But there's also something about it where you feel unease because, well, it's foreign. You know, in, in, in German, we have, we have an interesting word. It's called unheimlich. Unheimlich. It's unhomely. <laughs> That's what that actually means, that word. It's, 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 it's unheimlich also means it's a little scary, maybe. What does the Bible say? The Bible says we live in a world that is actually unheimlich, that is unhomely for us. It doesn't fit us. It doesn't suit us. It's not the place where we can truly just relax and be at ease and where we can flourish, where we can thrive. The, this world is not this kind of place. We're all homeless, not physically maybe, but spiritually speaking, we are all homeless. Why is that? Well, the Bible says right in the beginning in the book of Genesis that actually you and I, we were created to be with God. The Bible also says in some other places, for example, in Psalm 90, that um, God is our home. The Lord is our home. Now that means we were created to be in relationship with God, in His home. That's how we were designed to be, to live, to flourish. But our story is also that we have decided to turn away from this home, to turn our backs on this home, to turn from God because we thought we can find a better home somewhere else. And so consequently, uh, consequently we were exiled from this home. We rejected it. We were thrown out of this home, of God's home. And now this world that we live in, this world isn't the world that God designed it to be. You know this, right? This isn't the place that God had in mind. There's illness in this world. There's corruption. There's arguments. There's fights. There's divorce. There's, 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 there's death. There's illnesses, pandemics, wars, all these things. That's not how God had designed it to be. This world right now that we live in is not our home. It's unheimlich. 
<laughs> it's unhomely for us. It's, it, it doesn't fit us. It doesn't suit us. We weren't actually designed to flourish in this place. It isn't our home. It's not a place to flourish. Guys, we live, spiritually speaking, we live in exile. That's what this is. We live in exile. And the promise of Isaiah here is that God will come and recreate our home. God will come and make things will become good again. He will make all things new. He will come to save us. He will come to rescue us out of our exile. He will take us home. Isaiah promises that he will heal our homelessness in all these ways that we already looked at, these eight ways. He will make this world a home again where we can flourish. And the expectation that people had when they heard Isaiah was that, okay, the Messiah is going to come to save us and to establish a home for us. And what they thought that meant was the Messiah will come like a warrior, like a mighty warrior, and he will liberate us, the people of Israel, from Roman oppression at the time of Jesus. They were expecting a Messiah who would come with strength to forcefully uh, drive out all the Romans from the promised, from the Holy Land. Yeah, uh, that's, that was the expectation. But Jesus, he did not come with strength, although he could have, but he came in weakness. Jesus came right into our messed up world. I mean, look at Christmas. Guys, look at the story of Christmas. Look at the mess on Christmas. The homelessness in this story. The rejection in this story. The brutality of this story. You know, I think the problem is, can we be this honest? The problem is we have sanitized and sentimentalized the Christmas story. You know, in our homes, we put up these uh, cute kind of nativity sets, you know, out of wooden figures or whatever. And, and it looks so romantic. <laughs> it looks so warm and, and, and cozy. And, you know, it, there's baby Jesus in the manger. Look at him. And the hay that he's laying on is all sweet smelling and soft and all these cute furry animals around him. And Joseph has just lit a warm fire. Oh, isn't this just so special? Isn't this just so unique? And look at how Jesus came to us. Jesus is so lucky to have this cozy barn and that he has, doesn't have to stay in some random hotel room. Oh, how lucky is Jesus? <laughs> you see what I mean? We, we've, we've sentimentalized and we've sanitized this story. But Jesus, if you think about it, Jesus was born on the road. He wasn't actually home. He was away from home. His parents had to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the census. He, he was born on the road. Joseph trying to find a place for them to stay. Trying to find and then knocking on some doors. Can we stay here? And another door slammed on him. And then his, his, uh, his, his girl, his wife, Mary, he turned to him and said, Joseph, the baby's coming. And Joseph's like, what? No, not now. No, 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 how? No, hold it in. No, this is impossible. We can't have a baby here. What are we going to do? And, and, jo and Mary says, Joseph, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And Joseph says, well, let's go behind this house right here. And they find this barn, I guess. They find this random place and they go behind in the back of this house and where the animals were and it was dark and, and it was dirty and it was cold and it was terrible. Guys, Mary gives birth in the manure and the urine. That's where she has to give birth. We have sanitized this nativity story, but it was the most unsanitary birth that you could possibly have. There was blood, there was labor, there was sweat, there were screams, Mary in pain, Joseph freaking out, no epidurals, no rubber gloves, none of that. This teenage mother who got pregnant before she was married, who was stigmatized and rejected by her own community from in Nazareth, now was in this strange town and she gets there and she has to give birth in the manure and the urine of the animals. Guys, this isn't, isn't a sweet scene right here. This is supposed to make you weep. This is supposed to break your heart. This isn't sweet. Jesus was born right into the hardness and the inhospitableness of our exiled world. 
And Christmas was just the beginning of, for him. Look at the rest of his life. Shortly after he was born, his parents had to run for their lives and flee for Egypt because of Herod's baby genocide. And then later on, when he was an adult, Jesus actually says something in, in Matthew chapter 8 that he talks about himself. He says, the son of man has no place to lay his head. What does that mean? Jesus was homeless. He didn't even have his own house. Jesus was homeless. At the end of his life, he was on a cross outside of the city, which was also the big symbol of rejection from the community. You're no longer part of this. You're out of us, out of the city. Out. That's where we crucify you, this shameful death. And they mocked him. They said things to him like, if you really are the son of God, then why don't you step down from this cross? And they didn't see that he did step down. He did step, but not from the cross. He stepped down from his heavenly home into our exile to save us. What a savior. And on the cross, he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as well? He wasn't just rejected by the community. He was rejected here by God himself. Jesus tasted and experienced our exile. He took it upon himself. I, I want to show you something in, in the Old Testament, um, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. It talks about uh, a Jewish festival called the Day of Atonement, called Yom Kippur. Maybe you've heard about this, Yom Kippur. Uh, it, it's really about a ritual sacrifice that they did with the animals at the time. It seems quite foreign to us, uh, unheimlich maybe even, uh, because we can't relate to it so much. But let me explain it. Let me read it here. Leviticus 16, 21. There's something here that actually connects to all of this. Uh, it says, it's an instruction here for, sacri for, for sacrificing. Uh, Aaron, who's the priest, he shall lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, all the rebellion and the sins of all the people of Israel. And it says, in this way, he will transfer the people's sin to the goat. And then you guys, sh you, shall, you shall drive the goat into the wilderness. And as the goat goes into the wilderness, it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. Okay, it's a bit confusing, right? But you're wondering, okay, what's, what's happening here? The priest here, Aaron, he is supposed to actually get a goat, put his hand on it, and confess. And by confessing, transfer all of the sins of the people of Israel on the goat. To be like, well, we have worshipped other gods. We've, we've made ourselves idols. We have coveted um, we've, our neighbor's wife. We have lied. We, 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 were, we, we um, corrupted each other in, in our business deals. And, 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 and all of these things. And he, he would confess and confess and confess. And by, by laying his hands on the goat, it was said that this is what, how you transfer your own sin on the goat. And what happens then to the goat? It says the goat is supposed to be chased out, out of the city, out of the community, out of the gates, into the wilderness. This goat became a scapegoat, a scapegoat, because it, it, was, it was chased out because the consequence of sin is, all, is always um, exclusion, rejection, expulsion. That's the consequence of sin. But the goat gets the punishment so that the people deserve, so that the people can still stay in. The goat gets the punishment, and that's how the people were redeemed. Now, do you see this connection? Why did Jesus come? Why are we joyful on Christmas? It's because Jesus came to be our scapegoat. Our sin was laid on him. All of our sin laid on him, and he was literally whipped out of the city chased out of the city and crucified outside of the city gates. He's getting the ultimate rejection, not just from the community, but also the rejection from God, the exile. He's getting all of that, the homelessness that we deserve so that we can be brought in, so that we can come home. That's how he made a way home. That's how he redeemed us. And in Isaiah 35, verse 8 and 9, it says, And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the highway of holiness, and only the redeemed will walk on it. Jesus is our Redeemer. 
He did that for us and he redeemed us so that we don't have to be chased out into the desert. He sets our feet on a, on a highway of holiness that leads through the desert uh, on, a, on a way that's higher than the desert, a, a good way that leads, leads us home. One of the stories that, that Jesus told, uh, one of the parables, maybe his most famous one, is the story of the prodigal son. I'm sure you're familiar with the story in Luke, uh, I think, chapter 15. We often take that story as a conversion story, and that's obviously correct. It is a conversion story, but it's also a story of exile and homecoming. It's a story of exile and homecoming. It's our story, guys, that there is a son here who left his father expecting to find a better home somewhere else. He, he's exiled. He chose to be exiled. He, he broke off the relationship. But then he doesn't find what he's looking for and he becomes homesick. He starts to long for home and he comes to his senses and it says that he returns. Here's that word. He returns home and he's welcomed by the father and there is a feast and there's joy and there's dancing because the son realizes when he comes to his senses, he realizes home is where my father is. Home is where the father is. Everywhere else is exile. Everywhere else is homelessness. Do you see it, guys? Home isn't a place. Home is a person. Home is the father. And Jesus came on Christmas to show us what the father is like and to make a way for us to get to him. And Jesus will come again one day to bring us home so that we can be with him and enjoy the Father forever. And it won't be just us. I don't know what kind of picture of heaven you have. We won't just be floating around in the air, kind of, woo, you know. No, there will be feasting. There will be singing. There will be dancing. We will eat. We will laugh together. We will dance in Zion, in this home, this new home that he creates for us. Verse 10, those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return, will come home. They will enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. And that is our Advent hope, which is why we can be joyful today. Let's pray together. And Jesus, we thank you for coming into our mess we thank you for the cross. We thank you for redeeming us. We thank you that you are setting our feet on a, on a highway of holiness, on a way out through the desert, a way that leads to a land of fruitfulness, of, uh, of joy, of, of laughter, of glory, of healing. And we celebrate this Advent we're, we're, next week. <laughs> we're going to be celebrating your first arrival, Christmas. But Lord, we also want to pray, come back, Maranatha, Lord, come and bring to completion that which you have started on Christmas. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart, I invite you to just to pray with me. Uh, Jesus, I am in exile. I am homeless. I understand today that I am far from God, who is my home. And I also want to be on this road that leads me back to the Father. I, I don't want to be alone in, 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 a, in a homeless land anymore. I don't want to be in exile anymore. It's unheimlich here. I want to be with you. Jesus, thank you for making a way. Today I say yes, I want to receive the forgiveness and the grace that you offer. And I want to invite you into my life. And I pray this as much as I know how. I will invite you now. Amen.